Glenna was almost 57 when her husband of 30 years said, you're getting older. So are you, she replied sarcastically. Then he said something that would change her life. He said, I don't need your kidney right now, so maybe you should donate it to someone else. Her heart stopped. She immediately knew it was time to start testing to donate her kidney. Don't be like Glenna and wait 20 years to decide if kidney donation is right for you. The time is now to break the silence and share the facts about living kidney donation. In this 15 minute video, we will discuss the options, costs, benefits, workup, and the process to get started. Keep watching if you want to learn more. If not, you can go watch funny cat videos instead. Why should you care about living kidney donation? Well, you likely know someone who has chronic kidney disease and needs a kidney, and that's why you're watching this video. Maybe a family member, friend, or stranger is on dialysis or getting close to needing dialysis. They likely have been worked up and are on the kidney transplant waiting list. Unfortunately, on a kidney transplant waiting list, only one in four people get a kidney. If they don't get a kidney, they will either die, go on dialysis, stay on dialysis, or eventually die on dialysis. Let's be real, none of those sound great. So what is the typical solution for finding them a kidney? The current solution is to encourage more people to register to be an organ donor at death. This is called deceased donation. Theoretically, if there are more deceased donors, more people will get a transplant. Currently, 60% of adults in the U.S. are registered, but less than 1% of them will actually donate upon death. Glenna was registered for years and thought that meant she would donate. She was wrong, but why? There are three main reasons. The first reason is your organs must be healthy. That means you are likely younger and do not have any chronic illnesses. The second reason is you have to die the right way. Typically, this would be a brain injury from a motor vehicle accident, drug overdose, drowning, etc. You would be in the hospital, in an intensive care unit, on a ventilator, and brain dead. The third reason is your family must consent to donating your organs. Most hospitals will not proceed with organ donation without the family's consent, and you will not be talking. So registering really doesn't mean you will donate, even if you are healthy and die in the right way. Now let's look at this graph. This graph is providing numbers for organ donations. Black represents the transplants performed, and blue represents the waiting list. There are 90,000 people on the kidney transplant waiting list. Even if everyone registered to be an organ donor when they die, the number of kidney transplants performed would not even double, so this is clearly not enough. This is a partial solution, but it is not solving the huge problem that exists. On top of that, the wait time for a deceased donation kidney is five years on average, during which you're likely living on dialysis. Let's discuss that and other treatments a little bit more. Dialysis is okay. It filters about 5% of your blood compared to one healthy kidney, and all other kidney functions are lost, like returning hormones and vitamins into your bloodstream. That's why people don't feel well on dialysis. Even better than dialysis is a kidney transplant. With a deceased kidney transplant, people live 10 to 15 years longer than dialysis, as a deceased kidney donation typically lasts 10 years. A living kidney transplant is even better though, it's a shorter wait time and lasts almost twice as long as a deceased kidney transplant. And getting a kidney transplant before starting dialysis, in other words, preemptively, gives the best outcomes and longer life. In general, a kidney transplant provides better quality of life, more free time, more stable blood pressure, hormones, and electrolyte levels, higher rates of employment, and a decrease in kidney disease symptoms. Next, you might be thinking, how does a kidney transplant work? Your kidney is removed in surgery and then placed in your recipient. Typically, the two diseased kidneys are left in place in the recipient. Since we've already reviewed deceased kidney donation, let's talk about some ways to be a living kidney donor. The most common way to be a living kidney donor is through a directed donation. You want to donate your kidney while alive to a specific person, like your friend, mother, or son, and you are a match. That means you have a compatible blood type, tissue typing, etc. But what if you want to donate, have blood drawn, and find out you aren't compatible? Many people stop the process here and don't know there are other options. However, a paired donation can be a great solution when you really want to donate but don't match. In this situation, you want to give your kidney to your friend, but you are not a match. 
there is another pair like you that does not match. All of you go into a computer program and it matches you with someone else who needs a kidney, while your friend matches with another donor. This is a paired donation. Often these matches can be better than a directed donation because more people are in the computer program and you might find a better match. A better match means the kidney will likely last longer for the recipient. Isn't that what we really want for those with kidney disease? The best kidney and longest life? So don't worry about the match. You can still donate and your friend or family can still get a well-matched kidney. Another way to donate is a non-directed donation, where the donor doesn't know the intended recipient. You may feel a calling to donate your kidney to someone, but you don't know anyone who needs one. Maybe you don't care who gets your kidney, you just want to help someone prevent or get off dialysis. This is what Glenna ended up doing in 2017. Donating a kidney to a stranger may also be called altruistic or good Samaritan. With a non-directed donation, your information goes into a computer program and they match you with someone who needs a kidney. Typically someone who has a harder time finding a match or a chain that needs a starting donor, but more about chains in a minute. Advanced voucher donation is a specific type of non-directed donation. Here is an example of how it works. You would like to give your kidney to your daughter, but she doesn't need it right now. You decide to donate to a stranger now instead. Your daughter gets a voucher or a coupon for a kidney later. Later, when she needs a kidney, she turns in the voucher. She goes into the computer program and is matched with a kidney donor. That is what Glenna did with me, her daughter Amanda. I have a voucher in case I need a kidney in the future. Another amazing benefit of non-directed donors is the potential to start a kidney chain. One type of chain is a non-directed chain. Remember those pairs in the computer that are not compatible and waiting to be matched? Let's say donor 1 is matched with recipient 2. Donor 2 is matched with recipient 3. But donor 1 will not donate until their loved one, recipient 1, gets a kidney. It takes a non-directed donor to come in and be matched with recipient 1. Now the chain, sometimes called a domino, is started. This benefits the most people but again, can only be started with a non-directed donation. Now let's discuss the costs, safety, and benefits of donating a kidney. First, what are the potential costs to a donor? Fortunately, the cost of surgery and the donor workup is paid for by the recipient's Medicare insurance, but it takes time for the workup, surgery, and recovery. Some donors lose money in their lost wages, childcare, and travel expenses. Next, there are some potential psychosocial or cultural barriers. Donating might cause emotional distress. The workup might be stressful and you might be concerned with the health of the recipient through the donation and recovery process. Your motivation to donate is explored, so you might be put to the test with waiting and wondering what's happening next. Donors might not be made aware of the benefits they're eligible for that would help with the process. There may be a lack of support from donors' family, friends, coworkers, or others, and some people have cultural and religious concerns. Economically, there can be indirect or direct costs. The financial burden varies depending on your occupation, benefits, income, the ability of the recipient to pay for expenses, and knowledge of financial assistance programs. A lot of people are usually wondering, how safe is donating a kidney? As far as surgical risks, less than 3% of living kidney donation cases have major complications. There is a less than 0.03% surgical risk of death within 90 days of donation. This is the same as childbirth and less than having gallbladder surgery. The risk of developing end-stage kidney disease is lower in donors compared to the general population. There is a slightly higher risk of high blood pressure in pregnancy after donating. Donors live as long or even longer than the general population, not because they donated, but because they are healthier. But are there really benefits after going through an unnecessary surgery? Most living kidney donors score high on health quality of life assessments after donation. Most donors have a boost in self-esteem, increased sense of well-being, improved relationship with their recipient, and almost every donor says they would do it again if they could. Glenna's life is definitely better after having donated her kidney. Her only regret is that she only had one kidney to give. If she could donate more kidneys, she absolutely would. Well, have you ever wondered what it would be like to go through the donation process? The first easy, private step is an online health questionnaire. You don't have to tell anyone. This will determine your general health. 
If you pass, you will be sent urine and blood supplies to be tested at a local lab. Many people like doing this privately, before committing to donating or even telling anyone. We have also made it easy. On the Kidney Donor Conversations website homepage, you can click See if you can be a kidney donor, and this takes you directly to the National Kidney Registry Questionnaire. What does it take to be a kidney donor? You cannot be pregnant, your lipid levels need to be normal, you need normal kidney, liver, and heart function, you must be able to take time off work for testing, surgery, and recovery, you cannot have diabetes and must have normal blood glucose, you must pass cancer screenings, you must understand and consent to the short and long-term risks, your blood pressure must be controlled, you have to be mentally stable with no suicidality and be oriented to person, place, time, and events. There are limits for smoking, alcohol, and drug use depending on the transplant center you use, and you have to confirm you do not feel pressure or obligation to donate. What could an imaginary kidney donor look like? To be clear, this is not actual information about Will Ferrell, but this hypothetical person could have a BMI of 30, normal colonoscopy and prostate-specific antigens of one nanogram per milliliter. They might enjoy fishing, going to the beach with their kids, and watching Netflix. They might be on one antidepressant and seeing a counselor, and on one blood pressure medication. They're a non-smoker, but they've used cannabis in the past, and their family is concerned but supportive about the donation, and they enjoy two beers a day. Transplant centers have their own specific policies on the criteria. If you do not pass at one, you can go to another and they may accept you. Once you have gone through all the testing and have been accepted to donate, what does the surgery look like? Surgery takes about four hours. Most often it is done laparoscopically with some small punctures and a small incision where they take out the kidney. Or it could be open where they make a larger incision to get the kidney. The type will be determined by your transplant surgeon. After surgery, you will wake up with one less kidney and post-op, you'll have incisions, oxygen, a Foley to drain your urine, a pump with IV pain meds, heating pad for comfort, and you'll take a stool softener daily to help with the ease of your first bowel movement. The first day, you will likely be helped to get out of bed, take a few steps, and sit in a chair. Around day two, if all is going well, all the tubes are disconnected. You will then take pain pills and possibly be discharged. Donors are told to walk, walk, and walk some more to help relieve the gas that was put in during the surgery. Within one week, you will likely only need over-the-counter pain meds like acetaminophen. There is no driving for about two weeks, and you can return to work in about four to six weeks. Follow-up visits are at six weeks, six months, one year, and two years. You can live a healthy life with one kidney. After one kidney is removed, it starts working harder to compensate for the missing kidney and may even get a little larger. It now does all the filtering work to keep your body healthy. Many donors describe the donation as a non-event. It may seem like a small aspect to their life. They have the surgery, then feel normal, and forget about it as they go back to their day-to-day -day life. For example, Patty on the right donated her kidney to Doug in the middle. He is now off dialysis and enjoying life and vacations with his family again. This picture was taken one month after surgery. Thank you for your desire to break the silence about living kidney donation and possibly help one more person live a longer, happier life. If you have questions or would like more information to sign up for our monthly newsletter, read our educational blog posts, or talk with someone, you can reach us at www.mykdc.org. Thank you.